Good evening and welcome to the MyCP webinar series. Uh, glad to be back after taking a little summer hiatus in uh, July and August. Hope all of you stayed uh, healthy, uh, avoiding COVID, avoiding smoke, avoiding heat. It's been a, it's been a long summer. Um, anyway, but really excited to get back to the, the program and uh, particularly excited about tonight's topic because it's an accountability topic of coming back to the community about work that we had done in 2017 about setting a patient-centered research agenda under the name Research CP. I'm really excited to have Dr. Laurie Glader here, uh, who is the director of the CP uh, program and, comp and the section chief for the complex care at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, she's going to uh, present an analysis of where we are five years hence in uh, research CP. Uh, as usual, I am going to begin by uh, doing a quick run through of the sort of state of the network. So for those of you that have been to many, feel free to, uh, I'm actually gonna mute everybody for a moment. Feel free to, uh, you know, um, go and enjoy yourself. This will take me uh, all of about six minutes, but then I'm gonna dive into a little preamble before I introduce uh, Dr. Glader um, to do the uh, sort of progress on research CP. Okay, so um, CPRN is made of uh, two companies that came together in 2021. Um, the CP Research Network was born out of an NIH workshop on CP in 2014. A uh, group of us set out to define a, a national CP registry, but there were four other objectives from that meeting, and we ended up uh, in the long run coming together and subsuming all of those uh, in the creation of the CP Research Network. Also at that meeting was Michelle Schusterman, who came away with a, a commitment to create uh, evidence-based information in lay language for parents getting a diagnosis of CP. Uh, and she was also uh, created CP Now to focus on the care uh, and uh, the well being of people with CP and their families and to be a funder of research. Uh, last year, we decided to merge our efforts, which was four websites of content coming together and forming one organization and operating under the name the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. And our mission in that combined effort is to optimize the lifelong health and wellness of people with cerebral palsy and their families through both high quality research, education, and community programs. So some key milestones uh, since we, uh, since our organizations were created was in the education arena. Uh, the CP Toolkit was launched in 2015. It's been distributed to over 4,000 people. Uh, and has been translated into uh, Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, we went on to produce the Wellbeing Guide as a guide for parents in 2017. And then in 2020, we launched MyCP and enabled uh, personalized information for people uh, with, with CP. Uh, on the research front, uh, we did go on to uh, fund to find that clinical uh, registry and launched it in March of 2016. It's now up to 7,500 uh, patients included in the registry. And then later we launched a community registry aimed at collecting information about people's lived experience. And that's got about 1,400 people divided roughly equally between uh, parents and caregivers of people with CP and adults with CP. One of the first efforts that we did in research was to go off and get funding from PCORI to fund a patient-centered research agenda, uh, which we ran the process in 2017 and published it in 2018, and that is the subject of tonight's uh, webinar. We went on to get some significant public funding uh, uh, for the registry and for genetics in 2019. Uh, and we've also implemented four quality improvement initiatives across the network. These are ways in which we systematically improve care uh, at our centers for people with CP. And from an academic perspective, we've now produced uh, seven publications. We've had over 20 academic presentations and we've got five more manuscripts uh, in the hopper being written. And then on the wellness uh, front, we launched uh, a virtual wellness program uh, back in um, June of 2021 in conjunction with Staying Driven. 
Uh, and then we also partnered with a National Center for Health, Physical Activity and Disability to offer the mentor program to members of our community, which is a mindfulness exercise nutrition uh, program. Uh, so we are a not-for-profit that is uh, a really a collaboration of institutions, clinicians, therapists, uh, patient, advocates, patient advocates, researchers, all working to conduct research to improve outcomes for people with CP. Uh, we are in the last month of having a data coordinating center that is hosted by the University of Utah. We are moving that to the University of Pittsburgh um, over finalizing that by the end of this month. And there at our data coordinating center, we host our two registries, our clinical and community registry. And then we have our education and well-being programs. Uh, the, one of the most important of these programs is the MyC Pre, MyCP program, which is a personalized web portal that you can find on CPRN, and it gives you an opportunity to participate in research through the community registry, uh, to engage with peers and clinicians uh, about priorities in research, uh, to receive personalized web info, and to get access to our, uh, our exercise programs. So just to convey what a little bit of the role that registries play, uh, the clinical registry means we collect data about people that come in to the hospital, to a clinic or to a clinician's visit. And this is an example of two data points of several hundred in the registry. One is gross motor function classification system or GMFCS about how people with CP uh, move around in the community. And you see a distribution there that looks a little bit like a U. Uh, and then on the right side, you see our age distribution. And because many of our clinical centers are pediatric in focus, you see it sort of leans to the left with uh, got roughly 20% of the people um, uh, in the network are, uh, are adults. And then um, if you look at gross motor function, classification system, and age in our community registry, you see a uh, you know, smaller number, but uh, a very different distribution that corresponds a little bit to who we can find online. So there's a bit of an online bias as opposed to who comes into the clinic for care bias. So those are two, just two examples of data points that we use to help accelerate our research. So overall, our programs are community engagement in research. On the right, you see our uh, research and quality team. And then right there uh, next to Ed Herbitz, you see Larry Glader, who will be speaking to us shortly. Uh, we have our educational uh, materials and then our health and well-being programs. The network is spread across the United States. We have about 30 centers. The green pins represent sites that are collecting data today into the registry. Yellow pins are working on the technology. Uh, red pins are working on the uh, compliance information and blue pins are sites that have raised their hand and said they want to join the network. So we exist to accelerate research as one of our primary functions. And so this is our research pipeline uh, that we've been filling over the last uh, seven years. So on the left is concepts that get developed uh, as um, part of the work uh, that we do. These are, these can be driven by investigators, driven by community members. Uh, we really encourage community members to get involved in uh, the generation of research. They go on to apply for funding. They get implemented as studies, they execute, they produce evidence, uh, and then we seek to publish that evidence and roll the evidence of that treatment back into the way people are cared for. That's a lot of what these QI processes do that are here in uh, that are here in orange. So with that, I want to go into the Wayback Machine and talk about Research CP, the process, before I hand it over uh, to Dr. Glader to talk about uh, the results of the last five years. So this is the whole group of uh, 45 of us assembled in Chicago in one very large, slightly noisy room. Uh, where we got together and uh, worked through the process that I'm about to describe. So uh, it was conceived, Research CP was conceived of saying, we want to be patient-centric. We want to work on things that the community cares about. Uh, so that was uh, essential to what we were doing. And we wanted to involve 
uh, both parents, uh, parent advocates, and adults with CP um, to help us inform what's what's difficult to what's difficult uh, to do with care and CP that we could improve through uh, research and quality improvement, uh, and then to take what came out of that process and communicate it broadly. Uh, not only for use within guiding our network, but also to other medical professionals, researchers, government uh, granting agencies and the like. So we went off to the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute and got funded for uh, a, an engagement award. And what we set out as the objectives there were we would con conduct a series of webinars that we'd use to educate everyone that was gonna be involved. So patients, caregivers, uh, people from the community, clinicians. And then uh, we built and distributed a survey. This was an electronic collaborative platform uh, to really gather input both from the community members as well as the uh, clinical community to figure out what were the priorities in research. Uh, in research. Uh, and then we wanted to convene an in-person a workshop to review the results of that and then publish. So that's what we set out to do at the beginning. Uh, the way that looked is we had about 275 people that participated in webinars in uh, April of, uh, in March and April of uh, 2017 that provided really basic education on the key areas of research, uh, research tools and the state of research for CP. Uh, the surveys, um, about 200, 200 people went on to participate in those surveys and generated a total of 392 ideas uh, for research over a 20-day period. Uh, and then we brought together 47 people uh, to Chicago for a day and a half to review what were the top 20 ideas that came out of this process, and we culled the list down to 16 ideas. Uh, so to give you an idea of who participated, you can see the distribution of the 275 that participated in the webinars, uh, and then the 200 that went on to participate in the uh, survey mechanism that generated the ideas. Uh, and then we actually measured their percentage of their contribution to what resulted and from which communities or constituencies we drew from to participate in the workshop uh, in, in the long run to get to the 47. So you see it was quite a balanced uh, group between members of the community and, uh, and clinical providers. So just to give you a sense, we were in uh, one big room in Chicago with some breakout rooms. We did a lot of our work in these small group breakouts that were really a great uh, mix of members of the community and uh, clinicians. Um, we had many, many very powerful moments about how valuable this exchange of ideas was from really from both sides. And the little, uh, the, the green polycom is John, where John Borland was listening in from, uh, from Ohio. Uh, and so we really, um, we, we spent time in like introducing one another where everybody had to introduce the person next to them. It was just a great way to, uh, to get to know one another. So it was a very, very powerful event People came from all over. So these are the pins for all the people that participated in the workshop in Chicago. Uh, and then in the end, we did produce not a white paper, but a published peer reviewed paper that was published in developmental medicine and child neurology in August of 2018. Uh, there were some limitations. We were missing an adolescent voice. Um, our survey tool tended to favor broad topics versus narrow topics. We had a bit of a selection bias um, because we use social media to, to recruit. Uh, and the um, results were influenced by the relative participation of different uh, groups. Um, although in the end, the community did contribute more than 50% of uh, what resulted. So what resulted, I'm not going to go into this, were these 16 top ideas. And what I'd like to do now is turn, turn it over to Dr. Ari Glader, uh, who, in addition to being a, the medical director of the CP program at Nationwide and the section chief for uh, pediatric complex care, uh, she's also a 
a professor at Ohio State. Uh, she's a member of our steering committee uh, since the, the beginning of this year for the CPRN. And she's actually the incoming second vice president for the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. And so with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Clater. Thanks, Paul. Uh, perhaps I will share my screen. I think that would be great. Thank you, guys. Hmm. There we go. Okay, let me know. Can you can you see my screen? We can see your whole screen now, not like a slide view. Yeah, yeah, I will go to that. All right, there we are. Um, okay, well, thanks so much. It's uh, it's it's fun to be here tonight. I'm trying to minimize us so you don't have to stare at that the whole time. Um, the 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 topic that we're talking about tonight really was born earlier this year when CPRN had its annual meeting and Paul pulls us all together, uh, researchers from across North America uh, and clinicians and and um, and uh, we do all sorts of updating and exchanging information and it's it's a lot of fun and and he had charged us with thinking about next steps. And as we were thinking about how to approach that topic, it seemed really prudent to pause for a second, even as we were planning steps forward and to say, well, we put together an agenda and I'm using we in the royal sense because I actually wasn't part of Research CP, uh, but, but CPRN and the community did put together this amazing agenda five years ago. And it seemed really wise to take a moment to say, okay, what was that agenda really? How does it relate to the work that CPRN is doing now? So uh, we decided to do a little bit of a, a deep dive into some of those um, concepts. All right, here we are. Um, so these are the results that Paul alluded to. These are those 16 different research priorities that, that emanated from all of that work. And the point right this moment is not to read through all 16 ideas here because it's kind of overwhelming and a lot. Uh, but you know, what we did earlier this spring was to start thinking about what are the, what are the big themes that come through, the big bites of the pie? And so we, we bucketed them um, thematically. And the first thing that came across uh, that was one of the, the biggest themes had to do with aging. So many of these ideas out of this 16, six of them, in fact, specifically address aging uh, in their, their questions and their challenges. And the kinds of things that come up within those aging topics have to do with how do we work on enhancing participation? How do we work on maintaining mobility, maximizing function over the lifespan? And an awful lot about uh, how do we work on reducing pain, reducing fatigue, and the questions really come from both adults who are experiencing these things and, and wanting to mitigate them, but also from caregivers of younger children uh, wanting to um, look towards interventions that can then uh, modify some of these outcomes. So that was one of the, the really big areas. Another big area was just, um, a range of different types of interventions. There's a real interest in, in, in looking at outcomes around doing something uh, when it comes to CP. And you can see again, there were, uh, I think there were six, yes, there are six um, topics that also related directly to specific intervention. So if you do something, can you uh, enhance endurance, for example? Can you enhance participation and function and overall health? And what might those interventions look like? 
So clearly an area of, of great uh, interest and opportunity as well. And some of these things are, are uh, questions around traditional interventions, surgeries and things like that, pharma, uh, pharmacologic agents that we use a lot about therapies. Uh, some of them uh, pushed the, the envelope in terms of some alternative interventions. So there's really a broad range, but, but the, the fundamental ask seemed to be like, what can we do to impact these things like participation and function and overall health? And then we get to some smaller topics. Uh, neuroplasticity was one. And in fact, there was just one, one particular item that uh, spoke specifically to neuroplasticity, but it needed to be called out. It, it, it was very important. Uh, and, and this was asking for uh, ways uh, to, for researchers to consider how we might work with the plasticity of the brain, again, to improve outcomes, a, a, a big focus on outcomes research, which had been a topic in um, the, uh, the early educational uh, piece of uh, uh, research CP. All right, biomarkers uh, represented another very small sliver of the pie, but again, important. Um, and so it wasn't a specific biomarker that, that the uh, challenge was around, but thinking about this very broadly, but are there biological ways that we can identify that would help us to prognosticate, think ahead to which kind of individuals are going to respond best to which kind of interventions and really shift us towards a very personalized uh, and tailored uh, way of intervening when it comes to, to caring for individuals with CP. And then another one that was kind of a one-off, but again, very important, and that was around cognition. And um, here, it, it was sort of a plea for anything because there's so little work done around cognitive impairment and CP and really understanding um, some of the potential challenges that arise, uh, much less how to intervene and optimize outcomes. So um, that was uh, one other category. And then finally, there's this, this quality of life category. And again, uh, there is a particular line item that, that calls out quality of life and, and suggests that we need a really good way to measure quality of life because if we're going to do these things, you know, we want to be able to really um, measure that as a, as a discrete and quantifiable outcome. And, um, and in being able to measure quality of life better, We'll be able, it will be able to better assess how well our interventions work. Um, but as we thought about it, quality of life really appeared to us to be much more than just this single line item and really felt like the most pervasive, uh, if you will, um, theme of all that in fact, if you look at any one of the research agenda items, they all ultimately turn to quality of life, being more comfortable, having um, more capacity for um, uh, participation, better functional outcome, things like that, and things that really do affect quality of life. So that just seems like a, a super important area to pay attention to. So for those in the crowd who are visual, like I am, um, it kind of helped to, to make a pie graph here of all of those different categories, those different themes, and, and the green and the red here relate to the um, intervention and the aging, respectively. And then the other pieces of the pie are those neuroplasticity, the biomarkers, the cognition, the quality of life. Um, which were sort of individual pieces of the pie, if you will. Um, and then there's just this, this overlying sense that a lot of these themes, um, regardless of which piece of the pie you were talking about, really were thinking about um, out, 
outcomes around enhanced stamina, uh, a, a lot of therapeutic interventions and outcomes, participation, the function mobility, and the, the, the pain and fatigue things that, that came up again and again, that those permeate and that um, those in a sense then are, are the things that make up concepts around quality of life and, and measuring that as an outcome for all of these different types of things. So with that, we sort of sat back and thought about well, what is this, what does this mean for CPRN and all of the, the researchers involved in, in the network and, and beyond. Um, and really uh, it, it seems that there's an ask that um, to link specific interventions or specific characteristics about an individual. Is it GMFCS level? Is it a biomarker? Um, is it age? But to link those characteristics or those interventions for some, to some sort of long-term outcome. Um, and there really is this uh, lifespan sort of um, uh, focus and frame around all of this. So that was the, the thematic analysis that we did. And then um, we asked ourselves, so how does the current body of work that CPRN is doing now in 2022 uh, doing in terms of relating to that research agenda that was proposed now five years ago? And how does it align? And are there gaps? Are there areas that we still need to be thinking about that we haven't started to address? So um, here's that pipeline that uh, Paul shared with us just a little bit ago that shows various uh, studies and qualitative uh, uh, quality improvement projects um, in various stages of development. Um, as he said before, on the left, it's really conceptual. And then we go all the way towards getting approval and executing the study to uh, finally publication. And, and what's really fun is that it's getting crowded over there in the manuscript and publication um, arena, uh, which means that some really good work is being done and that knowledge is being disseminated. Um, so, and the, the yellow uh, uh, bubbles, as he had mentioned, are, are the QI projects. So a little bit of a different category from the, the uh, other research projects, but um, uh, equally important uh, uh, in terms of the work that CPRN is doing. Um, so they're all here to outline the body of work. And then this is one more visual going back to that pie and thinking about the breakdown of things and then overlaying um, uh, a large percentage of the things from that pipeline that relate in some way to those identified priority areas. And so there's a lot going on in terms of interventions um, as well as evolving things in the um, aging category. Um, you can see in the specific quality of life, which is the lighter blue, there are a couple of uh, different projects uh, that specifically call out quality of life. Although again, quality of life is oftentimes incorporated into um, uh, many of these studies. Uh, some of the single slices of pie are a little bit slimmer. We have an amazing study going on with Michael Kruer around uh, the genetics of CP. Uh, that is the one uh, piece of work that currently relates to that biomarkers category. But we, we uh, uh, at this juncture, uh, don't have anything specifically related to cognition or neuroplasticity per se. And, and Paul, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, if, if something has cropped up, uh, but I believe that that is- uh, Nope, our, you're correct. Our most recent, yeah, tally of things. So that's where we are. Um, lots and lots of great work. Um, and it's really interesting to, to look at how it aligns to that agenda that was generated five years ago in that, that coming together of um, 
community and individuals with CP and caregivers and, and researchers alike uh, to generate this prioritized agenda. Um, and, you know, as we continue to move forward, uh, it would be wonderful to think through with you, you know, what, what comes to mind as, as all of this has been described uh, in terms of gaps or in terms of that alignment? How does it look to you? And do we need to update the agenda again or other ideas for future directions? So um, I think I will stop sharing. And uh, Paul, maybe we can just have some. Yeah, I think we can just open the floor. Uh, we can open the floor to questions. And if you would prefer to type your question, feel free to type it and we'll uh, just uh, queue it up from the chat or you can unmute and ask, ask your question directly. I guess I'll, uh, I'll start with a something, a, uh, uh, maybe not a softball, but um, one thing that you know, you, we point out that neuroplasticity work is not there, but could you say from where you sit, it seems to me like there is a lot of work going on there, uh, Dr. Glader, in, in the field, even if it's not going on in CPRN, um, in particular for, for young kids, but. Yeah, there is a, a, a the field is full of um, wonderful activity around the early detection of cerebral palsy, which used to be, uh, you know, two years or older, and now is really pushed to oftentimes below one year, uh, or at least a provisional diagnosis can be given uh, much younger than previously. And it that early diagnosis really opens up the door to earlier, more intensive interventions, and so that that impact of earlier diagnosis and earlier interventions is a, a, a really live area of research. So I would agree with you, Paul, there's a lot going on, um, not at this moment, particularly with the, the network, but in the field for sure that is happening. Questions? Go ahead, Duncan. Uh, this is a more personal observation and not sure how it might tie into any studies that have been done. Uh, I am now 76. When I was in my mid 50s, I began to experience uh, chronic fatigue. And it was the fatigue that had the greatest impact on uh, my employment, my leisure activities, et cetera. And uh, my PMR doc um, uh, uh, got involved, and um, uh, I guess I can mention, uh, I prescribed uh, ProVigil. And for me personally, that pro-vigil had a, was like a silver bullet. It uh, very much addressed my fatigue issues. And for about a decade, I, I was rolling along. And then I would say that definitely the last five, six years, it's the, um, experience of pain um, uh, uh, pain that on any one day I might rate as only a three or four and other days more like a eight or nine and um, uh, but the circling back now is that my fatigue is more an emotional fatigue in dealing with the ongoing issue of pain. Mm -hmm. It's not the fatigue I experienced back in my 50s, which was just 
had a hard time actually staying awake in the afternoon. Uh, now it's more an emotional fatigue that is really wearing on me. Uh, and that emotional fatigue deals with um, the issue of physical pain. There's an intersection there, obviously, at least in my case, but. Thanks for sharing that, Duncan. Um, Laurie, did you, were you about to comment? Well, I was gonna say thank you for, for sharing that as well. Um, I think that uh, we are getting smarter and smarter about what happens as people with CPH um and appreciate input um from from individuals like yourself who can help us to understand uh perhaps what to anticipate and it's really as as you could see from that conversation five years ago i think it really drove a lot of energy around what to research uh, in order to help people better manage those issues, the pain and the fatigue in their different manifestations over time. And, um, you know, linking it back to the network, uh, there, there is an active uh, QI group around uh, lifespan concerns, adult concerns. Um, and those are big topics that you just, that you just uh, mentioned. So your experiences align very much with, I think, uh, other concerns that we've heard raised and, and that are being addressed. And I am, I am really part of that QI group that's addressing the issue of pain, so. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, Duncan is actually- the choir, sorry. <laughs> yes, Duncan is actually, uh, you know, deeply involved and, and joins the group every two weeks. The other thing that I would say that the network is doing is, the adult survey of well-being and pain, which is really intended to capture uh, functional decline um, and uh, and issues with pain. Um, many of you have participated in that. We've actually recently gotten some funding that we hope will really allow us to expand the N, the number of people across GMFCS. If you recall the distribution I showed of the um, uh, of the GMFCS in the clinical registry where that study sits, I'm sorry, in the community registry where that study sits, it's it's stilted towards, you know, uh, there's a heavy uh, bias towards GMFCS too. And so we're doing a lot of work in that area, but, uh, and we do hope that there will be follow on hypotheses and funded studies to do more work in that area. So both where you're contributing Duncan in the QI uh, area uh, and that research that's being led by uh, Mary Gennady, I think will produce um, results when we get our ends to be bigger so that we can use that to go and get more funding and answer questions. So Christine, you're next up. Oh, thank you, Paul. Yeah, I'm an occupational therapist uh, out in the West Coast in Northern California. And um, one of my contracts is with the Bridge School uh, in Hillsboro. And we're doing a little research study. Uh, and also we did a, a, an institute for children with uh, cerebral palsy this past summer with cortical visual impairment. And what we're finding is it's so pervasive right now that a lot of folks think, oh, the child's not smart or he's having visual spatial difficulties when, when there is an intervention that can help that um, early on and help them see better. So I'm wondering if that has come up as any research topic because it is really hot right now um, and it, it affects the younger um, quality of life. It affects their education uh, so much uh, that um, we're doing a little study on it and it's not a big study, but we're doing that. We're also recruiting, um, we're going to be doing a study looking at self-directed mobility for uh, young children like two to six and what impact that has on their language, their participation, their, um, their participation with peers, uh, their 
you know, cognition, um, because so many times I go to these homes and the children are just six years old and they're still lying on their back in an asymmetrical position, which is not how we develop vision. It's not how we develop our upper body in our, in our eye-hand coordination. And I see it over and over. And I feel like there has to be a movement to get these kids upright, not in static, because everything is static for them. Static standards, static wheelchairs, and John, you're talking about exercise. These kids don't get to exercise, not even on the playground. They're still being pushed in wheelchairs. And when we show before and after, like what the child can do and how he actually gets eye to eye uh, at peer height, it's tremendous. It just makes such a quality of life difference. So um, I, I just wanna put that forward and let you know that we are putting together a survey uh, of parents who are using it and clinicians and school, school OTs and PTs. And if there's any way we can connect with you um, with the survey, I will pass it on to our research team. Uh, but I, I think that it's a early, when we look at early intervention, that is one of the big keys that to, to me over the 20 years I've looked at this and tried to get these kids using self-directed mobility uh, has made the biggest difference in their lives. Thanks. Well, that's amazing work that you're doing, and I, I assume you're publishing. Yes, uh, I'm. I'm not, but the uh, the team will publish. The uh, Sarah Blackstone is part of it. We have a whole combination of uh, speech and language pathologists and special educators and OT and PT. So yes, yes, eventually. That, that, I mean, it's such important work that you're doing and it needs to get out there. Um, uh, I will let Paul speak in a second to, you know, any potential affiliations with the, uh, the network and the communications that, that uh, the network has. But, um, you know, I think that uh, in some ways, if we think about that pie and that slice that's about cognition and, and, and a little bit the, the, the dearth of work that's going on there, I think that some of the things that you're talking about are, you know, adjacent to that, right? I mean, it may I not agree. be formal, like intellectual ability per se, but if you have trouble sustaining vision and processing visual information, and if it's not appreciated or it's not addressed, your learning and your participation are gonna be very different and, and your cognitive profile may look very different. Um, yeah, and I, I so agree. And it's really difficult because when these children go for an eye exam, your typical optometrist has no concept, even some of the ophthalmologists, it's improving. It is improving, um, especially I think regionally, but you know, it, it's just very frustrating that they have to go on year after year with this um, disability that could have intervention. Yeah, no, for right. sure. And, and, and with the uh, self-directed mobility, you're looking at um, outcomes on participation, on self-esteem, things like that? Yes, exploration, self-esteem, uh, interaction with peers, uh, uh, accessibility within the environment. So, and how it might affect your ability to have some kind of communication because I was working with a student who uh, was trying different um, upright mobility devices and walked over to, he was on the floor just rolling. That's all he could do. And then when he got up, he walked over to the counter and he reached up and grabbed a cup. And I looked at his mother. I said, do you think he's thirsty? Oh yeah, maybe he's thirsty. And, and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> it's just, and another one went over the refrigerator and opened it up. And we gave him yogurt and he goes, thank you. <laughs> I mean, he was the one that got the yogurt. <laughs> so there's story after story that would just make you laugh. I'm telling you, it's just, uh, it's really inspiring when you see these kids up moving, whether it's, whether it's a manual wheelchair with big wheels because they all end up in strollers until about the age of six, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a self uh, propelling walker or a standard that you can move and self propel, or it is a support walker, like a gate trainer that's hands-free. We don't use not hands-free. We want hands-free to start exploring and using their arms. And uh, that's what life's all about, not restraining the arms while you're moving around because we're not there when we do that. Let me, um, let me say uh, one or two things about that before I turn it over to Michelle, who is very passionate about this topic. So one of the challenges within the network, um, you know, it's great to have our patient-centered research agenda 
it's great to have these specific topics. And as I said, that the agenda tended to favor very broad topics and not get into specifics like a CVI kind of issue. But one of the biggest challenges is there are not enough uh, researchers. And one of the things that, um, that really helps is having a very uh, vocal and interested uh, member of the community that we can potentially find and pair with someone. And so I would love to talk to you about your study, about our ability to get surveys out to uh, the patient uh, community, the caregiver community, and uh, and help you because we think this is really important. So Great. Michelle, I'm sure you uh, you un unvideoed or you videoed, and I'm sure you have something to say about one of your favorite topics. So go ahead. I do. This is one of my um, favorite topics for sure, and it's because of the experience I had personally that I really have understood the. Um, the way an individual can tra be transformed when you address issues with visual processing. And I actually learned about CBI sitting in um, a lecture at the academy meeting many years ago that I didn't think I needed to be sitting in. And another parent said, you have to see this woman speak. And it was Christine Roman. Um, and there's a, an, group of women, it just happens to be women, um, that are studying vision and cerebral palsy from a number of different angles. And it is fantastic. I don't think many people are aware of them, um, but I do have their information if that would be helpful. And before you, um, you shared your passion about CVI, I was thinking, you know, as I go through my day with my daughter, who's now 15, and I think, uh, I think back about how her days have, uh, how we have executed her day with her, um, I always longed for an opening somewhere, like give me one area where we could not even resolve, but have an opportunity to help her move forward. And it's very upsetting to talk about, but um, she has made great progress. And a lot of the opportunities that opened up for her have been around exercise, which I never thought would be possible, and vision. So very practical things that I think we can work on as very a community. Good. Yeah. Great. All right, I want to turn it over to another uh, research CP uh, alumni uh, or alumnus, alumna. Uh, Poonam, do you have a question that you want to, or a point you want to make? Oops, you're, uh, mute. you're, you're muted. Sorry. There you go. Um, I'm also very passionate about CVI. Uh, and so I wasn't going to talk about CVI before, but since I heard the last two speakers, Christine and uh, Michelle about CVI, I wanted to just piggyback on that a little bit for a second. Um, so Jay didn't get a diagnosis of CVI until he was in middle school. Um, so it was, it was, it took so long. I mean, we, he was, he had retinopathy of prematurity uh, so he had this vis vision and the uh, strabismus and all that from birth. And he was being treated for that. But then at age 11, he, his ophthalmologist said, I can't do anything more and I'm done. And now you'll just have regular eye exam, no CBI diagnosis. But, but then he, had, he was skipping lines when he would read. And I said, why is he skipping lines? And he goes, I don't know. I'm not a reading specialist. You got to go to a reading specialist. And we were basically kind of left as is. So I sought out specialists, ophthalmology specialists, and we started going from North Carolina to DuPont Hospital for children. And that's where I found a CBI specialist and that kind of opened doors for, for Jay. He got into the gifted program in school and really kind of took off from there. Um, okay. So that's a, that's a positive uh, twist to like, you know, getting the diagnosis and then learning how, what strategies would help them. Um, so that was the part about CVI. But my uh, other question I had was uh, when I was listening to Duncan um, was, 
I know he, Duncan, I think you mentioned that you worked till you were 50 or something, uh, if I heard correctly, and I recall collect correctly. Um, so I have been struggling. My son is 24 and he's in the PhD program now. And we struggle to think he, he does a lot of um, like he gets he gets physical therapy uh, all um, quite a bit during the week. And then he also does he has an extensive home program that he works on, uh, like Michelle said, you know, exercise, things like that. Um, Jay also does a lot of that. So all this takes a lot of time from him. So I'm thinking, how do we like envision work-life balance for a person who has such needs to maintain their physical condition and stay pain-free? And, you know, I mean, he experiences fatigue that I don't know if there's a way around it. I know ACPDM had some course on pain and fatigue, which I didn't get to attend, but... Um, I'm kind of trying to understand what is the work life, what does work life balance look like for a person like Jay? Uh, I, I don't know if I can answer that, but I work with adults also who I used to work with when they were in preschool. And I would tell you the majority of them have all kinds of physical back aches is the number one, all kinds of uh, joint pain, um, just like you're describing Duncan, but they're much you know, they're only 49 in their 40s and 50s. And um, so I had uh, two of them. Actually, we had an extra uh, support walker at our school. So I loaned it to them. And they really said that that exercise, just going outside for a walk around the block, helped them tremendously. And I think when you spend 90% of your day sitting or just standing, but you're not physically moving, I think that's one of the hardest things. I was recently hospitalized for like a week and I, I had tight hamstrings when I got out. I couldn't even sit, go from sit to stand because my quads were so weak. And I, I walked three miles before that. And I was just like, just took a big dive down and I'm still giving my, myself rehab to get back to that point. So it's, uh, it's very difficult once we give up on that exercise. And all of our students that leave the bridge school actually exercise during um, physical education. So they're an inclusive PE. So they do what they can do in their support walkers, which gives them or bicycle, whatever you have. And that gives them the ability to move around throughout the day, um, which is part of a class. And as well as um, doing it when they get home just for fun to go see the neighborhood. And so I think you can fit it in Poonan, but um, it has to be part of an integral part of the day, if you will. They use it at recess. Every recess, they're out there running around with their peers. John, do you want to comment I can, from, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, Amber, go ahead. Um, I was just going to comment from a personal standpoint and yeah. as an occupational therapist that I think it's it's about, um, well, balance, of course, for everybody, but, but, you know, what's important to you and just prioritize that. And, and I agree, putting it into... Um, you're just your daily activity and not necessarily therapy. I mean, I always tell my parents, you know, you're going to, you should always pick the birthday party over me. You know, that therapy should not be the priority over a birthday party or any socialization activity that's going to help your child later. I, I so um, agree with that. That's well said. So, so yes, I mean, do I still do things? Certainly I do, but therapy is not my priority at 50. I mean, formal therapy is not my priority at, at 50 unless it's necessary. And then of course I do it, but it needs to be within, you know, within your daily activities and, and your son is old enough to make those decisions for himself at this point. Mm -hmm. But I was I was more uh, alluding to, you know, how people are able to work full time and take care of all these needs. Well, I don't know that everybody can. I mean, I haven't been able to do that. I can tell mm -hmm. you. And mm -hmm. um, and then I have a, another health GI issue on top of it right now. And I'm not working 
at all um, and trying to get back to work in some uh, form or fashion. So, but I can tell you that I've never worked full time um, my whole my whole life, but I've worked as much as I can and I've done other things as well. So, you know, it, and, and some people can, and there's just other people that can't. I mean, I have many friends with CP and it's it's very varied based on many different factors, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you just have to wait, you know, I mean, your son will know and, and that will, that will show up just like, you know, everything in life shows up for us, right? For everybody, just mm -hmm. different, different, we all have um, different stories, but the same experiences to learn the same lessons. Mm -hmm. I I want to be conscious of time, uh, and I want to just I want to end by handing to John Borland um, to let him comment on this, and then I think he might have a general question, and then we're going to wrap up because we are already over the hour mark. So, go ahead, John. Did you have a comment about how you were able to integrate all the sort of fitness and have life balance? Okay. Um... I mean, basically, I've had a lot of changes going on in my life over the years. And quite honestly, my activity levels have dropped off and my pain levels have increased quite dramatically. Um, the thing I find basically, yeah, movement is extremely important. I mean, being sedentary is the worst thing you can do because it kind of it really tends to lock you into place. But I'm going to say something about therapy, and like I say, I have just a bit of a general question. Uh, I mean, I'm finding as I age, and I'm 70 now, but as I age, I need more, uh, let's say, just general activity for me. First off, I'm being limited such that I really can't do the activities that I used to do. And secondly, I need more than I can do on my own. I need therapists to basically go in and be stretching on me to keep me flexible, you know, and basically go beyond what I can do myself. And I'm still finding that very difficult because quite honestly, I can't get active therapy through my insurance providers right now under Medicare. Mm -hmm. And really, I'm doing a wellness program where I basically go in and work on my own, but you know, it's just not as much as I could be getting and I just don't know how to break the barrier. And that yeah. kind of leads to my general question. I mean, I'm hearing some of it here, but I mean, I grew up in the 50s and 60s with cerebral palsy and basically it was extremely difficult. And I'm just, Looking at it, I mean, situation is better than it is now, but I mean, the research work that's being done, just the general activity, I was a little bit amazed when I first came back into therapy after dropping off the medical radar screen at 18. And I was a little bit amazed at just how little movement there had been in, you know, just researching and understanding cerebral palsy. And I'm just looking at the work we're doing now. Do you feel on the clinical level that it's making a difference in perspective out there? Well, you know, just one second, if it's all right, Paul. There was a recent oh. study that came out on and um, a, a treatment that everyone does in California, pre pretty much everyone does it for CP, kids with CP and adults. And they, this is the second time they've proven that it really does not improve function. So they said hippotherapy does and going to the gym does and all these functional activities. But if you just look for once a week or twice a week, it's not going to do it. Yeah. Laurie, were you going? Do you want to comment? Um, well, I was just, I was just, uh, you know, unfortunately, Christine does bring up some some points. Uh, uh, there is a, a colleague uh, uh, of ours in the CP world, uh, Dr. Novak, um, who has done some uh, wonderful systematic reviews. And, and there is uh, one article in particular I'm thinking about that reviews all of the different interventions for CP and really ranks them. And, and that, that might be something of interest to, to look at. 
Um, but um, uh, I think that you're right, a focus on very functional things, Christine, uh, tends to be uh, uh, very, very beneficial and oftentimes very motivating for younger kids who are engaging in therapy too. So. Let me, let me wrap by saying thank you, Dr. Glader, for doing the work to analyze the body of work that uh, the network is doing overall and uh, presenting it to everyone here. And thank you all, uh, especially all of the alumni that tuned in to hear. Uh, please send uh, more comments and email about what you uh, think is good, what you think is missing, what you'd like to see us do more of, but thanks everyone. Greatly appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, Lori. Bye all. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.